All right, guys, welcome to another episode on the podcast. Got myself, Brian Gold, my co-host, Squints, and my good friend, Mr. Joey Carson. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. Yeah. And uh, you and I have met through multiple occasions over the years through our good buddy, Dan Fleischman. And mm -hmm. you got a very interesting history that we'd love to learn more about, my friend. Yes. Uh, well, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, and it, it definitely is interesting, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you've worked with some amazing people over the years. I won't ruin the story. I'll let you tell it. <laughs> um, I know you had a start off question. Um, I think I'm going to let him get to it because I didn't want to jump the gun. But let's uh, let's just start with uh, I know your background is in production. And uh, that means, you know, coming from a, a production background myself, that can mean any any number of things. So why don't you just kind of uh, lead the listeners and viewers into, you know, how you got started in the business, so to speak? Sure. Well, it's it, I, I got into the business quite by accident. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm basically a, a kid from Texas that uh, came out here with the dream of being a rock star. I had put myself through college uh, playing in two different bands uh, as a drummer. And during that time when I was in college, you know, I, I would go to school in the morning teach tennis in the afternoon, and then I'd play in the band at night. And it was a great life. It was a lot of fun. And I had spent um, so much time playing the drums, and I'd, I'd, I just had this dream of moving to California and being a rock star. And so on a whim, qu quite frankly, uh, I packed all my drums in the car and had my best friend uh, we t we put my drums in my car, and he and then we towed my car to California and drove through straight thirty hours, and then I was here. And I think I had maybe a couple of hundred dollars totally to my name, like literally no money. I had graduated from um, Texas A and M Corpus Christi. My alma mater uh, was in the my hometown, and. So I got here, I actually ended up staying with my brother who had, he had been out here years before going to the USC uh, School of Cinema Television. And he had this little studio apartment and he let me sleep on his couch. And so now all of a sudden I was here and you know, my hair was down to here. All I had was tennis clothes and I needed to get a job. <laughs> and I found a, this was back in the days when you would look for jobs in the classified ads in the newspaper, mm -hmm. so the late 80s. And uh, I found a job for a, a, a loan accountant at a bank and went in and interviewed and uh, I got hired. The interesting thing about that though was since I had no clothes, I went to uh, Robinson's May, which mm -hmm. back then, now it's, now it's Macy's, but it was Robinson's May. And they gave me a, a, a credit card for $1,000. And so I, now that I have this credit card, I went and bought, I think it was like three suits because you had to wear a suit at a bank. Uh -huh. And I hadn't worn a suit except maybe to a w weddings and funerals up till that point. And then, of course, I've got my long hair. Anyway, I, I ended up becoming this loan accountant at a bank, and I did that for about six months. And which was great because I actually learned a lot of uh, just the, how a bank works and how loans work and that sort of thing. And then one day, um, back in those days, you know, the two major publications in Hollywood are the, or even still today, are right. the Hollywood Reporter and Variety. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, probably from your career, remember they would have the job section in the back. 100%. And I, I saw this uh, job, it just said it was an accounting job, didn't say the company or anything. And the old joke with those, that, those classifieds in the back of those publications were like, you would never get a job from there, even though they were advertised like, who's gonna hire you? It's never going to happen. And so I called the number and I got an appointment, miraculously. And I went 
for the interview and I got the job. So now I'm a staff accountant at Columbia Pictures Television. For the shockingly huge salary for me at the time of twenty five thousand dollars. <laughs> a great great salary at the time though. Yeah, at the time it was it was it allowed me to uh, for me that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get my own studio apartment mm -hmm. for five hundred dollars a month in Burbank. And now I'm going to work there. And it was interesting because that or those and I was there for I think five years total. And that actually laid the groundwork for everything that I would be able to do later in my career. Because um, in college, I got a finance degree. So I didn't have an accounting degree. I wasn't an MBA. And I, I was not on the finance path. Like I wasn't, I'm not a CPA, didn't want to be a controller or a CFO or anything like that. But what happened in that job was, uh, the first part of that job was I interfaced, my job was all the television shows and films that were going on at Columbia, all, all the production accountants would send me their reports weekly, like the cost reports, mm. right? And so my job was to take all that information and then balance all that information so it fed up into the general ledger of Sony. And I would have to reconcile the bank accounts three different ways which was helpful because I had actually had to do that at my previous bank job. So I got promoted a few times. I think I was ultimately the senior financial analyst or something like that. But it was great because that's how I learned how the financial aspects of a studio sure, work, right. treasury operations, all this. And plus, I'm interfacing with all the people on the show. But I knew that that was sort of a dead end because, again, I'm not – and I had no financial aspirations. And then one day a job opening came up to be an assistant production accountant on Days of Our Lives. And so I took it. I might, I might also add that during this time, in those jobs, I was working 12 hours a day every day. I was just grinding it out. And then, so now I go, so now I leave the corporate headquarters and I go uh, on to the like lot where the production is taking place. So now in my mind, I'm closer to the action. And once again, I, I worked for a, a very nice lady, but she was a slave driver. So I was chained to my desk, but through that job. And then later on, I actually, I, I was the uh, production accountant on Days of Our Lives and Young and the Restless. And then ultimately ended up doing Married with Children a little bit and Who's the Boss, if you remember, during mm -hmm, the time. Of course. And I, I had moved from being an assistant to being the key production accountant. The great thing about that was the, you know, the fast pace, like you know how it is in production. Everything happens on a weekly basis. Like mm -hmm. it's not, let's do the month in, close. It's everything happens week to week to week. And so that's when I learned all the aspects of payroll, for the DGA, the WGA, IOTC, all that. So I had to learn all the union rules, all the overtime rules and meal penalties and things like that. So I learned how to do all that. And then, of course, just the massive volume of just all the bills that go into those. You know, those shows at the time back in the day were $50 million uh, annual budgets. So, and I was doing both of them essentially by myself. So doing all the payroll and all that sort of thing. So it was a great learning ground. And then, once again, another fluke of nature, uh, one of our, one of my uh, fellow production accountants came over to my desk one day and throws the Hollywood Reporter on my desk. And again, it's this job section in the back. And she said, hey, there's a, a job over here at, at Fox, you know, they're looking to hire somebody in production. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll call it. I don't even remember, that, you know, in these early days, email was just barely usable. I can't, I think both those times I actually made phone calls. I don't even yeah. think I emailed somebody. And so I went and uh, interviewed for that and they ended up hiring me, which was great. And this was really kind of the first 
I guess, next level break in my career. And, you know, these were the early days of Fox, so everything was going on. So we had syndicated television, which is like the daytime talk shows and the court shows and things like that. We also did all the cable television, which back in the day was, you know, a, kind of the way streaming is now. It's it's so... And and then we also did this. This is going to date me, but we that's when we did movies of the week. Yeah, I've done quite a few of those actually. <laughs> I bet, yeah, yeah, because yeah, your career is you were like really active, I was like right there, yeah, yeah, I did all of those. I did daytime. I was on days. I did I did those shows too as well. I you know I read for everything. So. Yeah, yeah, movies of the week were big. I mean, you could win an Emmy for one of those if it was good. That's right. That's yeah. right. Well, and and in your career, that's really a good thing. Like I don't think people really realize how virtually impossible it is to end up on a show even in a small role like you you know you lived it mm -hmm. it's very very difficult uh it, to even get the the call to go to read for something or to go to a casting session yeah. is very rare so the fact that you were doing what you were doing back then and and the big body of work you have is like fantastic yeah i got lucky same, yeah. same thing, same chance. Right. Started in Texas, ended up here. Oh, where in Texas? Dallas. Okay. All right. So, yeah. you, so I, 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 I follow the the path. You know, I had right. my mom helping me, but obviously, yeah, similar similar routes for sure. Well, it's it, and also you know, luck is definitely part of it. I think, uh -huh. but it, but you know, to, showing up. But well, and, but you stayed there too. Yeah. Like it's not like you you know, if you get in there and you do that and you get called back and you get go out for other things, that's more than luck. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, it's it's kind of like um, what, what, what are they the old saying? You know, luck is the intersection of uh, yeah. preparation and opportunity. Exactly. And so anyway, that was a really great time for me at Fox. It was about seven years. And in that time and I was, you know, running the production side of things. So I was dealing more with the budgets and the production schedules and things like that. And about halfway through my tenure there, the the president uh, came to me, and um, there had been a change in the financial uh, side of the business. And he said, I want you to do that too. Because, you know, most studios, you have a head of production, and then you have a head of finance. Those are two different departments, different roles. Traditionally, they're sometimes at odds with one another because mm -hmm. the production's trying to push the envelope and the well, finance guys money. are like, hey. Slow it down. You're right, exactly. And so, and, and I actually didn't want to do it. I, I turned him down the first time. I just, because I didn't want to be labeled the finance guy. Um, it but, makes people tense. Yeah, well, and it's just, you, you know, there's, you know, it's kind of like in the Academy Awards, they'd always have the little segment where the accountants bring out the ballots and everybody kind of laughs about it or whatever. Yeah. So I, I just didn't want to be that, you know, geeky finance guy. Um, anyway, uh, what ended up happening was he called me in one day and he said, I want you to do this job. You're going to do it. Like, basically gave me no choice. <laughs> you got no choice. <laughs> yeah. He, and he, he goes, trust me, he goes, this is going to be the best thing. It's ever happened. It's ever happened in your career, and you're going to thank me later. Now, at the time, I wasn't too happy about it, but it turns out he was right because now it gave me, a, you know, kind of a greater um, role and responsibility, and I was able to work on both sides of the equation. So I was, I was actually able to be more effective in both those roles because each one supported the other. So if producers wanted to do something that was maybe over the budget or they were running over on their schedule or something like that, I was able to figure it out since I had the whole picture in my head there. And so I did that for a number of years. And then, then we had a management change. The, uh, the president left and a new president was coming in. And as you know, in this business, usually what happens when the new guy comes in and they yeah, clean house. clean house. They kill all the projects. It's similar to like when a new coach comes into a football team, they bring their own guys and that. And and at that point, the only really the, the the next logical step for me in my career would have been to get that job. But I was never going to get that job because they don't. That job doesn't go to guys like me. Uh, just they, they tend to be more like from the sales side or the creative side, not so much from the operations and finance side. Also, too, I was the kid, right? So internally, I was still you know Very young. Good. I was too young for it, and nobody would. Even though I 
my my time at Fox I, is one of the fondest times in my career because we I had exposure across all the other areas of the company and I um, the bosses that I had were really generous and and mentored me and they took me to all the meetings with the big shots and that sort of thing and so I had a lot of exposure I learned a lot and and it was great because you know this was at the beginning like when Fox Sports was getting going yeah. Fox News was getting going so we had interaction with them to varying degrees and the other interesting thing about my Fox job was I had never been to New York hmm. and I'll never forget I had the uh, you know, I had to go to New York for the very first time, and a, and the town car came and picked me mm -hmm. up. We're all used to that yeah. now. With Uber, all back then, you, you had to have an account. You know, it was very expensive. Uh -huh. Town car comes and gets me. I fly to New York. I stay in this gorgeous hotel and that, and then it ended up where I was back and forth to New York all the time. I practically lived there because we were doing so much production there. So. Um, but yeah, like, I think NYPD Blue and those shows, I think they were popping up there. Now. Yeah, yeah, that, that. And then we were doing, we had launched, um, at the time, Fox, uh, FBC, Fox Network, mm -hmm. didn't have a morning show. Mm -hmm. And they had, they wanted to, to launch that kind of, think of it as the Today Show, but on Fox. And so we had the green light for that, and we actually did it. And... That was a really interesting time because, again, I was back and forth to New York all the time. And um, the the president of our division at the time was a, a famous movie director. And he was in charge of everything, really creative guy. And so we got it up. We got it launched. And here's the interesting thing about that. So, it, it, But it, it only lasted a short while. I think we were on the air maybe six it was under a year maybe six months and then fox corporate killed the idea but here's the interesting thing that came from that we, so the our president he said i have a great idea why don't we on friday have a band play down on the street and you know we'll we'll shoot live from the street and we'll have some band come and play well the at the, at the time, everybody thought that was an insane idea. It was too expensive. We want to do it. But he did it anyway. But it's interesting that later, that became a state, like the Today Show they started doing exactly. that. Right? But at the time, no one had done that. And, you know, we were criticized for doing it because, it you know, it was, who's going to watch that? Nobody's, nobody's going to care. The other really interesting thing is, on that show, we had three different correspondents that were at the time unknown and but, but they were fantastic well those three people were tom bergeron who went on for dancing with, with stars jeff probst mm -hmm. with, with survivors you yeah. know and phil kogan to amazing race so that early nascent show that got canceled ended up producing the three guys that have been the staple of unscripted television for the last 20 years wow right and it's so again good incubator it was a great it was great it was a great idea it was a lot of fun so the, you know, there's a lot of little things like that throughout my career where i've interacted with people like that or that have gone on to do these unbelievable things but that's a story probably not a lot of people know mm -hmm. is you know we were with those guys in the very beginning and then look at how, how huge they are today and the nicest guys ever probably. even with fox canceling it out yeah well you know that happens i mean it's uh, as as we know shows come and go or show you know sometimes you know you even see in the news now like netflix canceling you know some of its yeah. top shows you know these things happen from time to time but it's a testament to those guys and just how professional they are and how good they are that, you know, okay, so we go on to the next thing. Um, anyway, back to the career part. So I, I was at this, this juncture where I also wanted to do more. And, in the, and I knew I wasn't going to get the big job, and I knew they'd probably want to change me out anyway. And I had been, this feeling I had had a long time was like, I want to run an entire business myself. I've, I've never done that. Like I'm in charge of hundreds of millions of dollars here, 
But at the same time, I'm not in charge of marketing. I'm not in charge of distribution. I'm not in charge of advertising. You know, all these other aspects of the business. And around that time, uh, 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 an agent friend of mine who's a legend in the business told me about this small production company that was looking to go to the next level. And it turns out that was Buna Murray Productions, which was, they were the original company um, behind the real world. Yeah. The, you know, the first mm -hmm. show. And so I went and met with them and they had, you know, they were enjoying this great success with real world. And then they had also done road rules. Mm -hmm. And they, yeah, right. Road rules is gig. Yeah, it was fantastic. And then, uh, and then the challenge also, which you know, which is still on the air, by the way. Yeah, it is. Uh, but that was originally the uh, real world road rules challenge, uh -huh. like cast members from each. Yeah. But they had, they said, you know, look, we would, we really want to try to take this company to the next level. We want to grow it, you know, into, you know, maybe even a studio at some point. And because of my experience and, and actually having done that at Fox, it, it was very intriguing. And, and so I came on board and it was, it was definitely an adjustment for me because, you know, I'd been, had kind of grown up in this corporate world and learned all this. And now I'm kind of on the other side where I'm, I'm yeah. kind of like working on a show. You're rebel territory. Right. And it's, it's and like, unscripted, which is a, right. a new frontier that's not, right. nobody not was doing it. in the studio world. Yeah. yeah. At that time, nobody was doing it. Yeah. Like this was, you know, just before Mark Burnett did Survivor and all that. So, and they had, the way they did things, they had just a phenomenal team of people there. And essentially, the, the processes that they had in place and that we refined over time really became the basis of how all reality television uh, would be produced, at least for the next 10 years or so. And in fact, many of all of the people that were there that were producers or worked in development or whatever, they're all industry leaders now and have been for a very long time. But back then, it was when I first got there. It was like, okay, we have a couple of shows, and you know, the, the, we had the real world people, and then the road rules people, and we're kind of a little bit separate. So it was my job to really help get it to be one integrated company with a, you know, mission, and and put in processes in place that would help us kind of scale and develop, and we did that, um, and. Then what came out of that over the next few years was just a plethora of probably the, the first big break was when we did Simple Life with Paris Hilton. Mm -hmm. That was that was a really interesting thing in the sense that w one of the goals um, when I first got there, I was worried because the shows that we had were just on MTV. Yeah. And I thought, well, if they change out the president at MTV or something like this could go away tomorrow. So one of the goals was, okay, let's get a show on multiple networks. In fact, let's get a, let, and let's try to get all genres. Let's get a cable show, which again, back then there was more of a, let's get a network show, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Um, and then let's do a, perhaps let's do a daytime syndication show. Maybe we'll, do, since we're unscripted people, maybe we'll do a documentary, that sort of thing. Diversify. Exactly. And so we did that. We actually started developing things for specific uh, networks and audiences. And one of those was Simple Life, where we thought, you know, let's, what if we did the first reality sitcom, which is how it was in our mind. Mm -hmm. So it's a sitcom, but it's real, kind of you know, as real world, and it's on a network. And we were able to do that with Simple Life. And it, it ended up being huge for us because when we put that out, that's when American Idol was in its early days and it was the phenomenon that it was. And Fox gave us the primetime slot with uh, American Idol as the lead in. Yeah. So we had this huge audience. And then of course the show was actually really, you know, Paris was, was great. great. Yeah. Nicole was great. Mm -hmm. And, and our producer team that worked on it was really good at, cause there was a lot to deal with there as you can imagine. And it just, it blew up, it took off. 
And so that was a lot of fun. We also did uh, The Rebel Billionaire with Richard Branson. Oh, wow, that's cool. Which was fun. because So we got the phone call because that's when The Apprentice was really big. Mm -hmm. So, and it was, you know, the number one show, they were killing it across the board. So Fox's general idea was we have to come up with our own answer to The Apprentice, like something a little bit different. And they had signed up Richard Branson uh, to, do, to do that. And then they selected, he and Fox picked us to, to produce that. So that was a very fun show to work on because we, you know, we shot it all over the world. We used all of the Virgin, like I had to interface with the CEOs of all the Virgin companies, you know, Virgin, at, Virgin Atlantic, at the, yeah. uh, which is what it was at the time, Virgin Records. And then he had the resort business and that sort of thing. So. Unfortunately, that show only went one season. We did 12 episodes and then Fox canceled it. But here's another interesting thing. Uh, so it followed basically the same format that The Apprentice did. The difference was we used the jet as essentially the boardroom, which was kind of the twist on it. So that it, when you got eliminated, like Branson would be standing out there by the jet and be okay, Chauncey. All right, you're you're on to the, get on the jet. You're going to the next place, and then we go down the line, and then whoever didn't, whoever was fired or eliminated, got left standing on the tarmac. Kind of funny way to go. Anyway, the girl that came in second on that was um, Sarah Blakely, mm -hmm. the Spanx, the, and her idea on the show, her company, because we were working with real entrepreneurs. Yeah, Spanx. Yeah, and she's a she's, billionaire now. She killed it. Oh, killed yeah, huge. It. <laughs> yeah, like, um, she's been on Shark Tank a bunch. Had of times a Shark as well. Tank. Yeah. Oh no, shark shark she's. I mean, element to it then. Right. Yeah. But back then, yeah. on the show, it was essentially a startup, and she was just doing her thing. And so, it's, these all these little tidbits in my career, are really, like, yeah. really, really interesting. Anyway, that that was a, a really formative time in my career because I was just able to to do a lot of things. Um, along that time, you know, the, you mentioned that we were talking earlier about the World Poker Tour. That has an interesting uh, origin story as well because um, the producer that created that, he had come in as a partner with Norman Lear mm -hmm. to shoot a pilot on, on a, they had a game show idea, which is really good that we shot a pilot on that Fox didn't pick up. But uh, anyway, he and I started talking, we became friends, and he had told me about his poker idea, like for this show. And he actually ended up partnering with my assistant, the, 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 girl, the gal that was the assist, my assistant at Fox, actually became partners with him, and they created that. And again, they went and pitched it everywhere and got turned down everywhere. And then they were able to do a very creative deal with the Travel Channel, which again at the time was a fledgling startup yeah, network, right? And they were looking for something, and but be, he was able to negotiate a very creative deal where they retain the ownership rights, um, which is unheard of, uh, and it's very rare. Like Mark Burnett was able to do that with Survivor and The Apprentice, and it's really kind of unprecedented anyway they were able to do that with world poker tour and then as and then they put it on travel channel and then it just blows it blew up, up. Yeah. i mean that that show directly created the poker craze that still that went and still exists to this day yeah, it's coming back now uh, yeah the second boom in, in the yes game. yeah and so they had the very creative idea of taking the company public and so because they own the show, they own the content, they had the distribution tool there. So the idea was, well, let's take it public. So they did that. And I became a, one of the founding board members on that because in the beginning I had helped them out, you know, got them attorneys for this or that or production people or whatever and took it public. And then it, it just continued to grow over the years. And then I sat on the board of the, of the company. It was about 10 years or so. And then we sold it to Party Gaming. Mm -hmm. But a phenomenal success story yeah. um, for um, Steve Lipscomb, the guy that created it. And, um, and then later, ab about a year after that, 
they asked me to come in and, and kind of uh, into executive produce the show for a year because we wanted to try some different things or whatever. So I did that, you know, for about a year and a half. Did one season. Yeah, it was a fun show. I watched it quite a bit. It got me into like my my poker phase, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting time. I think uh, Chris Moneymaker had. I remember seeing the World Series on ESPN, like. It would just be the main event that they would show right sporadically you know throughout the year mm -hmm. um and then moneymaker won the world series the mm -hmm. wpt popped up in in kind of unison with that kind of thing and then you know people would ask like how do you even watch this it seems like such a boring in you know it's a long form game that can you know can right. be hard to watch for most people. It's kind of like watching golf or chess or something that's right. you have to be interested in. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, because people of the crazy it. characters and the math and the amount of money that was involved, it was high energy and 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 high intensity television, and it worked well in that time frame. Yeah, well, I credit that to the genius of the founder Steve Lipscomb because what he he saw the way to make poker compelling to watch because there is a lot of drama in a poker game mm -hmm. uh, but it's hard to how do you know how do you limit it to these things right yeah. and so his idea which changed everything was the whole card camera mm -hmm. which we got a patent on actually yeah oh wow yeah so that was that was the game changing idea 100%. and then which he came up with and then in addition to that uh, and again, we're all used to seeing it now, but the format of when you're watching the screen and it's showing the, you know, the cards come up and it's giving you the percentages and this mm -hmm. and that or whatever, like he came up with all that too. So instead of just watching guys sitting around. He educated it, the people he, in the game itself. He educated them. Time. Right. And you know, those, the show is really uh, a cut down of the final table, which mm -hmm. is usually 10 to 12 hours long. It's very long. Yeah. But the great thing is, is all the producers on that show, they're all they're all poker players. Mm -hmm. They all understand the dynamics or the nuances of, oh, he's got this or he folded on that. Like they know the the drama that's going on the t under the table. So while that thing is going on, the producers are back there taking copious notes, like every hand is logged, every reaction. And, and so they know. Helped so, in the editing process. Yeah. So we. Right, there's, there's a lot Key goes hands. into it. And you're yeah. taking a 12 hour thing and you're cutting it down into you know an hour and a half, say. And how do you make that interesting? Yeah. And so it's 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 a phenomenal job they do in post production, but it all happens in real time when they're doing it. Like the producers are all over it. So in fact, uh, you know, you know, um, Dan Fleischman. Uh, it, it's funny. A lot of people always think that Dan and I met from the world poker tour because he's a pro poker player mm -hmm. and uh but that we, but we didn't meet that way we just met through a mutual acquaintance um and by the way i don't know if a lot of people know that about dan like that's a really phenomenal I thought, skill i didn't he know that i oh, know yeah. he plays poker I I've, just... I've seen him at tournaments at, at cele uh, celebrity and uh charity tournaments quite frequently he's yeah. obviously very charitable yeah and uh i want to say that i've seen him pop up like earlier before I kind of knew who he was mm -hmm. in games here and there type mm -hmm. of thing, like televised games and bigger tournaments mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Yeah. So, but now it's, you're making it refreshed in my mind as well. Yeah. No, he's played some WPT events in the past. Yeah. Uh, I, I always joke with him. I say, why don't, why don't you just go do that? <laughs> Cause he's so good. Yeah. And um, so most people don't really realize that, but uh, he's a legitimate pro poker player. Or I always joke, people say, oh, I'm playing poker with Dan. I said, well, sure you want to sit down at that table? <laughs> you want to hurt. You want to tell us a little bit about what you have going on with Dan as well? Yeah. As we're getting as we're getting there? Yeah, Dan and I, we, uh, we've been together now about five years uh, with Elevator Studio, which was the company that he founded uh, originally as an influencer marketing agency. And... When we, we met through a, a mutual friend and, and we had lunch a few times and, and you know, we just were commiserating about all the people that we kind of knew a lot of the same people, but we had never met. And during the course of that, you know, it, it, and I was learning more about Elevator and, and the social media agency it was, he's, he's like, you know, I think I can have help like running this thing, you know, if you want to do it. 
And so that's how we originally came together. And it, uh, I really liked the idea, especially at the time, if I, th if I think back to my original thoughts, Dan, Dan reminded me a lot of Buna Murray. Like they were groundbreaking, they were doing something no one else had done and you know, kind of pushing the boundaries. And Dan was very much the same way because he was pretty much like one of the first people to get money from brands and get influencers you know, to promote the products and all that in the early days of that. He did more of that than anybody else. And um, we've had a lot of fun working together. You know, I've been, my career now spans over 30 years. And, you know, my relationship with Dan is probably the, how would I say it? It's, it's probably the, the happiest and the most productive, like, business relationship I've had. Like, we just, we, we get along really well. We're almost like a rhythm section of a band. Like, you know, he's the bass player, I'm the drummer. And he can be standing on the other side of the stage. I don't need to see him. I don't need to know what he's doing. But we're, you know, we're laying down the groove, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, we just kind of, we play off each other that way, which is great. And so, yeah, we've had, you know, it's grown a lot um, in the time we've been together. I mean, Elevator Studio, first and foremost, is a social media marketing agency. Mm -hmm. And the biggest piece is the influencer marketing piece, which obviously he's, expert and king of that but we've also we also do digital content production for other brands um various we have a couple of big corporations that we do we do consumer product companies and things like that and and then um obviously one of the most again to dan's credit one of his ideas was to have an elevator night which you've been a part of yep many times which is free for anybody that signs up Free for, you know, again, genius idea. So his idea uh, was let, let's have a curated event that's one night that's only three hours long, so it's not too painful. Like we'll do it from seven to 10, and we'll bring in entrepreneurs or companies that are startups or whatever. And then for the audience or the, the invites, let's, let's get some venture capital people, some high net worth people, other entrepreneurs so that the, um, the companies that come in can like showcase what they're doing or talk, but really more just kind of bringing together a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of investors into one room. And we, well now we, there's, he's, we've done a total of 51 elevator nights. And so I can't think of how many we've done in the last five years, um, probably 15, 20 maybe. I can't remember, but um, they tend to be about once a quarter. But the great part about it is, as you said, they're always free. Like, you know, we get the venue, we have the, th uh, the space, we get the guests to come. And it's just a great, you know, the, the people that I've met through just the elevator nights alone is astounding. Um, and That's how we you're, you're one of them, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, and, and like, where am I? Otherwise, we wouldn't have met. With some other, I, I, I saw you in passing at something, but right, we got the chance to be side by side on stage and really get to know each other, hearing each other's story, and then chat afterwards. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think yeah, it was originally we were on a panel. Yep. And so, th so those are kind of ongoing. Well, out, the outflow of that is when we started uh, the the other mastermind businesses. So the the one hundred million dollar mastermind, uh, you know, flew from that. Interesting. Here's a here's a little Dan story for you, because Dan, you know, as you know, he speaks at all these different, like he's in constant demand to speak at events and he's never and, home more than a day or two. Yeah, we always joke that we, the only time we see each other in person is when we're at like our own event together. Yeah. Other than that, we're like, you know, we we never see each other. So he, uh, I was actually sitting in a conference room one day at Elevator by myself, just working on the computer. And the door flings open and Dan wheels in a, a whiteboard, you know, one of these little whiteboards. He wheels it in and he says, I got an idea. I said, okay. And, you know, he says, listen, I, you know, I, I've been, go, I go to all these events. I go to all these masterminds. He said, you know, some are good, some are not so good. 
you know, he goes, but I see out of me going to all these things, I'm, I see what works, what's not working and what I think, you know, could do better. And he goes, and I want to create the ultimate mastermind. So I said, uh, okay. He goes, I'm calling it the $100 million mastermind. Okay. 100 people pay $100,000 for a one year membership. We throw three events per year that are lavish, big events, exclusive events at high end places. Then we do weekly live calls and he goes, and then we have 20 instructors that are entrepreneurs who have to, to, to be an instructor. You have to have either sold $100 million worth of Something. goods and services, spent a hundred million dollars on ads or have been seen by 100 million people. And so that's how it started. He drew it up, drew the whole little picture on the whiteboard, which I have a picture of. That's awesome. Yeah, it was great. And so that's how that came into being. And so that was in um, the beginning of 2019, I believe. So it's we, you know going on, getting ready to go into year four on that. Yeah, a little hiccup with the COVID thing, probably. Yeah, we yeah we there was a period of time there where we couldn't. I think it was we missed two events mm -hmm. like over like we did the first one, and then the of the 2019 and then 2020, we really couldn't have one, but it's, it's been back and in full force. And the, you know, just the people and the entrepreneurs I've met in that, and you've actually come and spoken at those yep. as, as well, which we appreciate. Uh, but it's just, uh, in fact, we just had one last weekend in Phoenix. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. You've had an amazing career uh, by chance. Um, yes. Starting in the accounting department uh, at Columbia. And uh, it seems like you hit the timing really cool to see real Hollywood, the beginning of unscripted television, mm -hmm. the takeover of social media and the monetization of it. Um, you've had quite the arc of, of timing because some people saw one piece, missed a piece and didn't really understand it but I'm sure that's helped you kind of evolve with the business and kind of stay on the forefront. Yes. And I'm sure some of your predecessors weren't so quick to, to head in that direction because it was foreign and, and uh, uncharted territory. You're totally right about that. I, I, one of the things that I'm extremely fortunate is to, I, I, like, as you mentioned, I've somehow been able to be at the forefront of what's going on. A good example would be back in 2004 when we did Simple Life. The, this was, uh, a, what happened was, you know, when you shoot a show like that, you have all this unused footage, right? Like just, we have like a thousand to one shooting ratio. Wow. And again, as part of just being an entrepreneur and trying to figure out how to have more revenue, I, I said, you know, what if we took some of this footage and chopped it up into little two minute episodes and we put it on the phone? And this, you know, this was 2004, so it's three years before the iPhone. But at the time, Verizon had just come out with what they called Vcast. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And so, right? And, you know, we're still talking flip phone territory. Yeah. And so we contacted Verizon, we pitched them the idea, said, hey, you know, we'll, we'll do, it's kind of like a behind the scenes thing from the simple life. Well, they agreed to it and they paid for it. And we ended up doing 56 episodes or we called them Mobisodes that went on Verizon and, and, uh, and actually ended up doing very well. Like we made like five or $6 million from that. Wow. But that was the first time that, um, and I had actually gotten that idea. Actually, there's an article mentions this story but i the way i'd gotten that idea was I, when my kids were little we were at disneyland and we were standing in line for the peter pan ride mm -hmm. and i remember in the and you know how it is when you're standing in the line at disneyland well all these people were on their flip phones 
And back, remember back then you really couldn't do anything on your phone. No, not like you can today. Right. And you know, they're texting or this and that. And I remember telling my wife at the time, I said, Hey, l look at this. Like half the people that were in line were just, you know, staring at their phone. Playing a little game or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, yeah and we were, it was very limited back mm -hmm. then. And, and I remember I, I thought, you know what, this, everything's going to be on the phone one day. And so it was from that that the, the whole Mobisode idea came from to like, let's do this with Simple Life. And then that happened. Another thing that was similar was at the time, you know, again, you're talking early 2000s, the internet is still what it is back then. And remember, uh, remember we all thought the world was going to end uh, yeah, on the when it to be right the Y two K like that's there's everything's gonna blow up and there's you know and so and again it was still the slow connection speeds or whatever and I remember we talked to MTV because again this was more like how do we make more revenue as a company how what are some interesting things because one of the things we kind of the vision that we instilled when I was at Buna Murray was like we we want to be innovators in everything we do. We want to be the first people to do this or to do that. And we were the first people to do the mobile video thing with the Simple Life. So one of the other things we thought was, hey, here's an idea. How about if the show airs on MTV, but then right after we interview the people on the show and we put it on the internet and i remember that mtv was like well that's that's a dumb idea that's not going to work and we're not paying for that <laughs> so we're like well we're going to do it anyway and so we started doing that and that ended up you know now all these reality shows have the after show right yeah but way back then when we we did that and we put it on the internet, it, it ended up working and you know, we had a good audience and then it just kind of became a staple and like went on from there. So I was very fortunate to just be like you say, I got to see the whole transition of the business um, through my career, like traditional network television, traditional the movies of the week daytime you know we launched all those court shows at fox we did mm -hmm. divorce court and we did another one called power of attorney um th that's actually an interesting story by the way on so remember the oj trial yeah yep. so again, that's yeah it is, like the right, right. i Which, remember my mom watching it every day just like she was hooked on it oh yeah right i remember my dad you know, watching it just just it was solid everybody was like literally if you had time you were watching actual court so my boss at, at the time at Fox, he was actually responsible for that. Really? Bef he, before he came to Fox, he, he was an industry legend. Um, he had st stepped in and he was running um, one of the, the local TV station here. And it was his idea to put that on all day because he would watch it and he was just riveted. And he's like, this should go. And so he was the one that decided to make it go all day. And then, of course, the rest is history. Well, a couple of years later when he's at Fox and, and my boss at Fox and we had launched divorce court and divorce, because again, we were, Judge Judy was the mm -hmm. big thing, right? So we were trying to see what we could do to make inroads into that. And we realized that Fox corporate had, we owned the rights to divorce court from way back in the seventies, mm -hmm. but they were, so it was basically some IP that Fox owned that was sitting there. So we said, well, since we own the IP, why don't we just spool this thing up and get it out there? And so that's how Divorce Court came to be. But then after, so the next iteration was, we were sitting around one day, all the creative executives, and the idea was, what if on all these court shows, they're all the same. What if on a court show you go and you're represented by a famous attorney? pleading your case. So that was the idea. That's so the show was called Power of Attorney. So we we got a judge which was Andrew Napolitano who you know who went on to be the like the chief legal analyst on Fox News for, you know, very long time. That was his first TV job. Wow. Right? And so then we went and signed up everybody, all the lawyers that were on the OJ trial. So we did Marsha Clark, Chris Darden, um, Kardashian, um, yeah. 
uh, all those people. And then then we went, we branched out and got some other famous attorneys. So we signed F. Lee Bailey, Vincent Bugliosi, you know, who prosecuted the Manson case. Mm -hmm. um, I actually spent a lot of time, um, probably one of the most interesting things in my career was I spent a lot of time with Vincent Bugliosi and um, just stories utterly fascinating yeah. ju just to be around him and, and and what he had done in his career and what he and f lee bailey too like spent a lot of time with them working on that and um so it's just like another little tidbit from my career um i'm not sure where i was going with that after that story but I, you know it was <laughs> i was kind of on the cutting in, edge the cutting edge of all these things and then you know after i left you know, murray uh, I actually had a tech company for a brief period where I was partnered. Um, my partners were Joan and Melissa Rivers mm -hmm. uh, and a couple of other people. Um, you know, the metaverse is really big now. Well, we Joan originally had had the idea of creating a virtual Hollywood. That was back in the day when like Second Life was big and mm -hmm. World of Warcraft were really the only yeah. kind of two things. And we actually raised venture capital uh, for it and that was that was another great experience because I you know I'd never been to Silicon Valley I didn't know anybody, and went through that process and we did like a four million dollar Series A raise just off the PowerPoint mm -hmm. and then had the company up and running and going, but working with Joan Rivers you know closely over that period of time and her daughter Melissa who's a phenomenal entrepreneur I mean most people don't probably know that or realize that, so we had a lot of fun together but they were very cutting edge. Yeah, pushing the envelope very much so, yeah. and and um, you know it was funny during during that time when we were doing that again the Apprentice was really big, and um, that's when uh, actually at that point it was the Celebrity Apprentice, mm -hmm. and I remember Donald Trump called Joan and said I want you to be on the show, and she was like oh, I don't know if I want to do it. Well, I said yeah, you got to go on there, you know. Like, <laughs> and uh, and sure enough she goes on and she wins. Yeah. Um, that was one of the better seasons. So, you know, just kind of a little fun thing about my career where I'm, you know, all these kind of touch points. Finding of, yourself in the midst of, of greatness at every turn, it seems. Yeah. Well, I was really lucky, too, I think, throughout my entire career to have really great mentors. Mm -hmm. And uh, which I think is critical for everyone's success in life like there's no way i would have been able to do half the things that i have done or have been involved in if it were not for the mentors that i've had i mean just and it's interesting because i didn't start out that way like when i was in the beginning of my career and obviously you know it's very competitive like all these people are from harvard and yale and you know they you know, have mbas and this and that and i'm just this kid from texas right and so the the I think the I don't want to call it a mistake, but the path that I took for the first many years of my career, at least until I got to Fox, was I'm going to do it all myself. I don't want anybody because you know think of how the politics work in those places. There's a lot yeah. of oh yeah right, and you I don't know it, who's your friend, who's not, what their intentions are. Exactly. What was the movie with Kevin Spacey swimming with sharks? Yeah about the agent and the agency and about the studio of just like how cutthroat it actually was yeah. in Hollywood. It really was like that. I mean, people don't really realize, they used to ask me like, what, what was your job like? I said, have you ever watched Survivor? It's like yeah. being on Survivor. And for me, I really wanted to, I wanted to rise and be recognized for the work that I did. I didn't want to have, get this job or get this promotion because I knew somebody or because I hung out with somebody, you know, I wanted it to be like, I did the work, I got recognized for it, and I got promoted or whatever. So, and through the years, um, starting with Fox is when I started to really be surrounded by great mentors. And uh, it, it just made all the difference in the world. Yeah, I try to tell my daughter and, and, and uh, kids out there that you know, finding somebody in a role that you want to be in or finding somebody that's amazing at a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
you know, bugging them or asking them for advice or mentorship and, and, you know, working for free and going out of your way to go above and beyond is the way that you really become successful in, in certain industries, you know? You're totally right about that. I mean, I was half, I'd say at least half the success that I had in my career was really because I, I was the guy that would volunteer to do whatever it was. And again, a lot of the people that were maybe more political actors, they didn't want to do that because it, they didn't want to be seen a certain way. And I would just raise my, I'll do it. You know, it. somebody needs to go to New York and do this, set this, I'll do it. And so by over time, I became very reliable and I, I made myself the, the go-to guy. Well, let's give it to Joey because we know he's going to get it done on time or what. And if there's a problem, he's going to figure it out. Yeah. And I think that was by being willing to just do even things that weren't necessarily, you know, my job title or under my per or maybe even looked as like, why would I spend my time doing that? But me doing those things, I think, is what set me apart. And especially my the in the corporate world, the, the bigger guys realize that like, hey, this guy's like Johnny on the spot. You want somebody that they can trust that's willing to do more than they're paid for, that's mm -hmm. willing to represent the company and shake their hand and say that I'm, I'm willing to do things that other people aren't. Yeah. It, it shows a, a very strong will and a, and a positive nature. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's uh, very lacking in today's, in today's times as well. Boy, you said it, uh, more than you know. Yeah, it's, uh, today's times is rough. Uh, you know, I'm, and I actually feel bad Honestly, for and th and this goes all the way up to people that are like forty years old. I just see a, a huge lack of just basic understanding of how to conduct business and how to communicate in business and to follow through and do what you say you're going to do. Everybody that I see has this, especially this younger generation, and now I sound like the 70 year old guy, no, on the, okay. you know, no. get off my lawn. We say it all the time. <laughs> you know, this is the reason we need to have these conversations. Yeah, it's I mean, it's really bad. It I mean, it's it's not just like, oh, this this is bad for, and, for the general population. And, and yes, and, and our structure as a whole, it's bad. Yeah, it, 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 we're it, operating from the wrong starting block. You are 100 percent right about that. Yeah. It's like a good example is like this ghosting business, right? Just, like you, I people don't talk to you anymore, and they just people just talk. disappear. Yeah. Like when, you know, in my day, you know, if if you if something goes sideways or or you're not going to do it, it's kind of like okay, no. You know, we appreciate your business, blah blah blah. Thank you, but we're going in another direction. No. Now they just poof. Now you just disappear or this or, you know, again, in business, there's all these vagaries of, you know, maybe somebody's paying their bills late or whatever it is. Or maybe there's some quasi breach of contract thing going on. And instead of just getting on the phone and saying, hey, like, here's the deal. This is what it is. And it's just they just disappear. And, you know, where I come from, that's a credit. You're done. You, you do that in, uh, in the world I grew up in, Career nobody's going to do yeah. business with you. That's like, you're out, man. The studio had a, had a Rolodex and a ledger. Yeah. And everything was kept, you know, and if you didn't, if you didn't do what you said you were going to do or show up and, and your number got thrown away, you just, everybody talked amongst each other. They didn't have to put it on social media or That's put right. it out there publicly, but they knew. if you got blackballed, it was because you know, you did something that you shouldn't have done. And the, the powers that be knew that, you know, maybe this person was a liability to the, to right. the structure of the business itself. Right. And listen, even if you did something you shouldn't have done or whatever it is, if you own it. It's okay. And acknowledge it. Then people can get past that. They can understand. Make mistakes. Yeah. Just don't and, sweep it under the rug, though. You got to have respect about it, though. Yeah. But I don't see any of that these days. No, I, I, you know, and just... Honestly, just basic business communication. Like, you know, if, if you want to deal, like I kind of made it a, a, cons a conscious choice to deal with, you know, because now, again, like you said, the world has changed. Well, there's still a basic way to communicate because now people are texting back and forth, hey, bro. Like, don't send me a text saying, hey, bro. 
right? Uh, hey, let's get on the phone, this and that. And I kind of thought, you know what? I'm going to have to maybe start teaching people how to communicate in reverse. You want to contact me, send me an email. Like, let's like schedule a Zoom call or whatever it is. Send me a proper email. Like nobody does that. Mm -mm, no. And so it's like, I'm, and I'm pretty available. Like I'll make time for whatever. But if you come at me through this weird channel, you ain't getting on the phone with me. Yeah. No. You're, you're not getting a meeting with me. And I'm sure your schedule is booked three months in advance. Because yeah. of all the events you have, you're always somewhere like, you're not there last minute of, oh, I'm just gonna take this last minute meeting just because. Right, it depends on who it is. And it also depends, like if it's somebody that, you know, kind of acts with a certain decorum like they should be. And by the way, it's not like I'm some snooty, you know, elitist attitude or whatever. I'm just like trying to think of how can I impart like basic business acumen and communication to people, that's right? Been lost. Might be a new course out there for you. I'm, I, it's, it, well, that's the beauty of my career is that I learned from all these old school guys how to deal with, you know, I, and I sat in those big meetings with, you know, household recognizable names, mm -hmm. right? Where they're looking at spreadsheets that I created or what, like I had to operate in that world. I had to learn how to do that. On budgets at the time that are, you know, you're talking today's numbers in a time where that was yeah, huge, huge budgets, you know, mm -hmm. things aren't produced. The production value is not the same as I come from a time when we made movies, we made movies and shot them on film and, and you know, five and 10 and $20 million budgets was, these were big productions, sets were built by hand, things were, oh, yeah. you had real, real professionals, there wasn't CGI, this thing was, was mm -hmm. a, it was a big deal, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a, as a studio time, it seems that you've had the, the great arc of, of touching all bases in Hollywood. Yeah, no, I'm really, like I said, I- It's fortunate to, I, to see the whole, to see the whole thing yeah and be in the middle of it. and help and help the transition to where we are now yeah because things have changed quite a bit they definitely have and they're going to continue to do so yeah what do you see uh knowing the past uh we're going to wrap up here soon but sure. what do you see going forward into uh the future where do you see entertainment headed what are your concerns what are your your pros and your cons so to speak well i think we're living in the the greatest time that there has ever been in terms of entertainment. I mean, think of the movies that we, you know, just in the last year that have come out, you know, something like Avatar or, you know, Top Gun, oh God, was which was, incredible. that was such a breath of fresh air. That, so that's, well that, that really is like a case study and like, that's what we all grew up with, you know? And well, just like, just the experience of like, think about it. I don't want to go to a movie theater. No. What, I, even in, even the nice ones where they have the lounge chairs or whatever, somebody's going to be talking, but like, what, when I can sit and watch it at home. I was in Vegas and I went to see Top Gun by myself because I do want to go to a theater to see that. Absolutely. I went by myself to see it. Too. Yeah. And that's, I actually watched the original one with my kids. Before. And the day before, and then we went, you know, to the theater. I mean, that's what movie making should be. Yeah. Like that, that was just like the ultimate thing. I give a lot of credit to Tom Cruise because- He still got it. He, well, not only that, but he made all that happen. Yeah, of course. You know, he's the one that made him wait, you know, over a year to, to put that out. He, you know, he, he drove that whole thing for the right reasons. And it obviously worked. It worked out, yeah. But I think that, so in terms of entertainment, I mean, I, I just think we're living in the greatest time ever. Uh, I mean, think of how many phenomenal scripted shows there are on uh, just across all the platforms. Like it's it's like too much. In it, fact, I it's overwhelming at times. It is, and it's it's also not good for my productivity when I'm up yeah. till three o'clock in the morning watching Swelling. billions. <laughs> right? Um, it's it's just I just need that one more. But everything is accessible. Everything's accessible. I think that one of the good things is, I, I remember way back in like the year 2000 when YouTube first came out. And I, I was on a panel at some Hollywood thing and they were, the big buzzword then was user generated content. And everybody thought, oh, this is gonna blow everything away. And I had a kind of a contrarian view because at the time, think about it. I said 98% of user generated content is unwatchable. Like mm -hmm. nobody's gonna. But now, 
that's not the case. I mean, think about all the personalities that have grown and developed all, strictly on the social platforms. Think of how YouTube has evolved over the over the time and, and the content that's on there now. And even now with TikTok, yeah. TikTok is phenomenal. There's so much good stuff on TikTok. Whereas before it was, remember, it was like, cat videos and dancing, dancing thing or yeah. that those days are gone there's some now it's evolved into like tips and tricks yeah. and, oh. and things of all nature i've learned just from my wife or my daughter showing me things yeah i didn't know i mean yeah just have everything right there and it's quick form so it's easy yeah and there's some really high quality production work going on there there really is um and like this talk of banning it is just insane I think uh, that it's very skewed and one-sided, but you know, yeah. that's not that's above my pay grade. So yeah. Of well, listen, they are every the, our government and every they already have all our information. Of course, uh, 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 and I'm they've had it for. About, I've never, yeah, I'm never worried about that. Yeah, and they've had it for a long time. Of course. So it's that's not what's we going on. We leave a trail on. everywhere we go. <laughs> so you're not you're not really hiding from anything. So I don't really worry about that. I don't, I'm not I'm not trying to yeah. Yeah. hide anything anyway. You know. Yeah, but anyway, I so I think it's. I don't, I mean, you know, the, the whole artificial intelligence and Chad GPT thing and, and the other ones that are out there, you know, now, now they can do the text to video sort just of thing. Just don't talk to Walter. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. He's a, he's such an interesting guy. You have to have him on here if you haven't had him. I haven't. Yeah. I'll have you help me with that. Oh yeah. No problem. Have Walter come on and talk just about s certain future, you know, trends. It's, yeah. He's it's just, fascinating and frightening at the yeah, same he's, time. He's the fifth smartest person in the world. Yeah, I bet I can. I can imagine that. Uh, that uh, that would be a great. I, I love going down the rabbit hole a little bit as well. Just on a conversational side, it's, it's yeah, nice well, to to think and to expand. You know, doing that with Walter is like the the you know the scene in the Matrix where they to take. The <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, um, we really can't conceptualize. Um, Anything you would want to share? I mean, obviously, we, we touched a little bit on maybe that the younger generation needs to learn how to have uh, timely and respectful manners uh, in regards to business sense mm -hmm. that maybe they weren't, uh, you know, they didn't understand the, the, the status quo and the pecking order of the way you, you go about things and, right. and stuff. But uh, anything that you would want to share with the, you know, the people out there as far as how to, I mean, have an amazing career such as yourself? Yeah, I think that um, my main advice or comment about such matters as, as your career is really, f first of all, if you, most people, you know, I have college age kids and I have worked with a lot of young people and a lot of, and they're always trying to f figure out like, or, or where am I going or what, what's my career path? Or they have an idealized version of their career path. And a lot of times it's like, well, what steps do I need to take to you know, get here and be the CEO, right? And what I tell them, like I never set out to do, I came out here to be a rock star. So the fact that I even had to work, I was not happy, right? <laughs> Uh, still not happy, right? Yeah. I still want to be the, get the drum chair in Van Halen. But, but what I did was I worked really hard. Yeah. And in every job that I have, even though it was something that I didn't want to do, for example, my banking job, I never would have picked that job in a million years. I, I took it because I had to and it was so available. Yeah. But I, but thank, for that job, I learned more about banking than I ever could imagine. And it was fantastic. I, I do a mentor thing with the, the students at my alumni and um, usually for a semester we'll spend time together. I also do it for the Hollywood Radio Television Society. And I remember last year there was a girl that I was mentoring that uh, she was a marketing major and she had a, a and the job she got out was with a, an insurance firm and she hated it. She was just like, what, you know, what I'm not, I don't care about insurance, I, you know. And I said, actually, this is the greatest thing for you. You're going to learn more about insurance than you otherwise would. You're going to learn about health insurance, car insurance, life, life insurance. insurance. Like all, insurance is a huge, huge part of your life. And we even if PI, you... We had a personal injury attorney on just before, so we've been talking about insurance all day. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah, and don't how, don't get how, me started. How much lack of knowledge there is out there. Dude, totally. Most people are ill informed. They have the bad policies. Yeah. They don't understand it. Yeah. Go ahead. No, well, my point to her was I said, look, this is just a stepping stone to the next thing, right? But you, so, number one, you're going to learn more about insurance that, than you ever w would have otherwise, which is going to help you in l your life in general. Number two, it's also insurance is a part of any business that you're on. Liability insurance, workers' comp, all that sort of thing. It doesn't go without it. Right. So when you go to your next job, whatever it is, even if you're in marketing or whatever, you're going to have this in your mind. You're going to be aware of the potential liabilities and cost of the company. You're going to be able to make better decisions. You're going to be able to help your company more. So I guess my point is it's it doesn't... Like I said, I never had the goal of being a CEO. I never thought it would ever happen. It, but it just was a natural unfolding of the events by me raising my hand and putting my best foot forward and always working harder than everybody else. And so I think that, I guess that's maybe my message is people get caught up, um, and especially now as we see on Instagram, it's, you know, with all these material things. Right, the cars, the going to the nightclubs, and like, I mean, the list goes on. Yeah, I mean, it's like enough already, right? I think it's not just fast money, but it's fast life. It's like it's a bunch of how to skip all the steps, and what we that, find is yes. the, the beauty is in the steps going themselves. through the process. Yes, you know, you you just hit the nail on the head right there. There, there's like a. So, so what is the old saying? It's it's kind of like along the lines of the seven deadly sins. Like one of them is wealth without work, right? It's like like getting something that you know handed to you that you didn't earn to get, right? It's not going to be the same. And I think that people, you know, this generation seems to be very impatient. They they want to be the CEO tomorrow. In fact, I know a lot of young CEOs of companies. They're like 21, 22, this and that. And they're really smart, really bright people. But a lot, but they don't, they don't even know what they don't know. Yeah. And, but they think they do. Mm -hmm. and, so, <laughs> and they act like they do. Yeah. So they end up making, a lot of times, not only dumb, but catastrophic decisions that put their companies um, at risk of serious liability just because they don't know the very basic things about maybe how to put a contract or how to do this contract with this vendor or whatever it is, right? Maybe 20 to 30 years, their predecessor would have never, would have never stepped foot in that area. But because they didn't come up from that, they, right. they don't know that that's, that's common nature. You know? Right. Well, the other thing too is I was at one of our events and there was, um, somebody was just bashing, um, uh, people with college degrees or people that had worked in the corporate world. Like I'm, I'll never hire any of them. I don't, you know, I don't care this and that. And, and I took the completely contrarian view and I, and I had said, um, and this was true for my whole career. Like I, for the most part, I would not hire anybody unless they had a college degree. And here's why. Number one, I dropped out of college five times. Right. It, I, I thought I would never graduate college and and I did. So my, my attitude is if I can do it, anybody can do it because I was really bad before I got my act together. But it's not even about the degree. I don't even care what your degree is in. It shows that you navigated that system and dealt with shitty teachers administrators changing the rules on you, your financial aid getting screwed up, not having money, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like just navigating that system and get finishing. That's the thing, nobody ever finishes anything. People are always starting something, they're doing okay, and then it just falls by the wayside or it goes into this ghosting thing, which that phenomenon trends, I think, in the actions in business as well. It just you start off really good, you got an idea, and then it just uh, fades away, right? So to me, finishing something is a really big deal. And then again, like the experience that I had about communication and learning how to work with people, that's a whole other thing that I learned because this guy was saying, I'm never going to hire somebody from the corporate world and this and that. And I actually had this conversation with him and I explained, actually, here's why you're being short-sighted. And like six, eight months later, he came back and he said, yeah, you know, you're right. Like I hired this guy and that guy and like now things are running smoothly. But it's like, I, 
you said it best a minute ago. Like they just want to skip to the end and be at the nightclub or be on the yacht. And they're what they're really selling themselves short because 100%. what you're not building yourself on a, on a personal character level. You're not gaining any skills that you need to be like, what, what good are you? You can't even enjoy it at the end. Right. Because you haven't learned how to enjoy it. Right. And if whatever you're doing or you made money goes away, well, now what? You haven't developed yourself, and uh, you know, as a complete individual all the way around. You know, those failures in the middle are like, I mean, I've gotten beaten down so many times and smashed and destroyed and, you know, messed with or whatever. Like, like any success I had came from learning from some failure like by far like me going through the meat grinder is what allows me to you know sit where i am today and just have perspective mm -hmm. i think that's the greatest maybe thing that i have to offer is i just have perspective it's not like i'm some genius uh i just have a lot of experience and i've learned the lessons and so and i didn't skip to the end there you go. <laughs> i think that we should uh Maybe we should wrap it up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you tell people where to find you? Um, the uh, Elevator Studios. Elevator Studios. Yeah, our company's Elevator Studio. The website is elevator.studio if anybody's uh, in the mood to work on some marketing. And then I'm at Joey Carson on all the platforms. So I'm LinkedIn, Instagram. And uh, again, my... Even though I'm supposed to be a marketing expert, if you look at my Instagram, it's, uh, it's, you know, just basically, I don't pursue that as a, as a personal brand as like a lot of our friends do or whatever. Yep. So, which I think is also a generational thing. But yeah, at Joey Carson on everything. All right. Well, appreciate your time, Joey. Yeah, I learned, uh, I learned a lot in this and just the, the trust the process. And uh, I think that there's a lot to learn for our younger followers out there that, uh, are a little lost and trying to skip to the end and don't understand that 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 steps were made to be to be stepped on you know and they're smart and all they need to do is work hard that's it that's all they need to do it's don't the best time ever like you said it is it's more at your i mean anybody from anywhere can watch this and find your handle yeah. and send you a DM yeah. and say, Hey, they, everybody's accessible at any point. You have, you have, you know, thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of years worth of experience at your disposal in any different form. And, mm -hmm. uh, they should start using it and, and use the wisdom of those that came before them to, uh, build the future that we want to see. You're a hundred percent right about that. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thanks, everybody out there. Like, follow, subscribe, and uh, we appreciate you, John. Thank you very much for having me. It was great to be with you guys. Thank you again, buddy.